Hello and welcome to my channel. I am the True Crime Maven and this is the first episode of Mind of a Monster. In this video, I'll be taking a look at a case from July of 1995, the murder of Janet Downing. Please note that I will be discussing a very violent and brutal murder, so if you're sensitive to that, please click away now. And out of respect to the Downing family, I will not be showing any crime scene pictures. So, here we go. We have two main players, Janet Downing and Eddie O'Brien. Janet was a 42-year-old divorced mother of four. She had two daughters, Carrie Ann and Erin, and two sons. 14-year-old twins, Ryan and Paul. Janet was a very petite woman, standing at just 5 feet 3 inches tall and weighing only 114 pounds. She was known to be very kind and generous, made friends very easily, and was well-liked and respected in the neighborhood. The Downing Home was a gathering spot for the neighborhood kids and Janet would always make snacks for the kids who came over to play with her own. She made ends meet by working as a medical assistant and renting out the other side of the duplex she called home. Eddie O'Brien lived with his parents, Edward and Patricia, and four sisters. Eddie's grandfather, Tommy, who was a retired police chief, also lived in the home. Eddie was exceptionally large for his age. At 15 years old, he stood 6 feet 4 inches tall and weighed close to 300 pounds. He was an altar boy and known to be a, quote, giant teddy bear. However, there was a very dark side to Eddie lying just under the surface. The dark side of Eddie started about a year before the murder of Janet Downing. He became obsessed with Janet. He would closely watch her daily activities. He had a telescope in his bedroom that had a view of the Downing home. He would ask Paul and Brian why their mother would sit in her car after she returned home from work. He once called the Downing home and asked why the light in Janet's bedroom was flickering. He would criticize Janet's cooking and told Ryan he thought she was a lesbian because of her close friendship with another woman in the neighborhood. He also told Ryan that he watched Janet through her window as she undressed. In the basement of the Downing home was a door that opened to the backyard. The door was difficult to open, and in early 1995, as Ryan and Eddie were trying to get a snowblower out of the basement, Ryan showed Eddie the trick to opening up. Saturday, July 22nd, 1995. Did you ever want to hurt somebody? Eddie worked part-time at the Midnight Convenience Store and once told his boss, John Arnold, who was also a knife collector, that he had two knives, one green and one red, that he wanted to trade. On the evening of Saturday, July 22nd, 1995, Eddie showed a green-handled knife to Mr. Arnold, who noticed that it had a loose, loose hilt and declined the offer. Later that same evening, Ryan was walking past Eddie's house when Eddie called out to him from his bedroom window and then came outside to talk to him. The two talked about plans for the next day, including a basketball game. Eddie then asked Ryan if he ever wanted to hurt somebody. 
Ryan replied no. Sunday, July 23rd, 1995. The murder of Janet Downing. Janet returned home from the store around 6 p.m. Eddie, Ryan, and Joey helped bring in the shopping bags from her car. After the groceries were put away, Janet decided to lie down on the couch and take a nap while Ryan and Joey walked to meet Chris. Eddie did not go with them. Ryan, Joey, and Chris returned to the Downing home and Eddie came over again. As the boys were hanging out in the kitchen and making plans for the night, Eddie slipped into the living room to play with the video game system Sega Genesis. Janet was still sleeping on the couch, and Eddie returned to the kitchen, asking Ryan if his mother was okay. Ryan said yes, that she was just tired. As the boys continued to talk, Eddie left the kitchen again. The boys next saw him on the rear deck, attempting to enter the kitchen through the back door. Ryan opened the door for him and explained that the doorknob was broken. Eddie asked if anyone could enter the house by that door, and Ryan said yes. Ryan, Joey, and Chris left the house to go swimming at another friend's house. Eddie declined the invitation and said he was going to visit another friend named Garvey. When Garvey arrived home at 7 p.m., he learned that Eddie had called him. He returned the call at 7.30, but Eddie was not at home. Garvey then called Ryan. Eddie answered the Downing's phone and told him that Ryan, Chris, and Joey had gone swimming and that he was coming over to Garvey's house because he did not want to swim. However, Eddie never made it to Garvey's house that night. At 8 p.m., Paul Downing stopped by his house for a few minutes to grab a quick bite to eat. Janet was still sleeping on the couch. Now, this is where it gets interesting. At 9.20 that night, Seth, Marco, and John walked to the Downing house to see if Ryan was They noticed that the front door was open, but the screen door was closed. Seth knocked on a window, and Marco called out Ryan's name. Marco then heard a loud sound from the back of the house, as if something was falling into the tree branches. The boys ran around to the back of the house. Seth went up onto the porch and knocked on the door. Marco and John looked under the porch. The basement door was open. They heard rustling and breaking branches in the bushes nearby. John walked out to the top of Hamlet, which bordered the back of the Downing property. From there, he saw a person crouched in the bushes. He believed that it was Eddie. The person jumped out of the bushes onto Hamlet Street and then began walking away. John called out, nice hiding spot, Ed. The person did not respond. Marco then stepped out onto Hamlet Street and saw the same person about 20 feet away walking down the road with his hands clenched and down by his side. The person looked over his right shoulder. Marco saw that it was Eddie. Eddie smiled at Marco, but said nothing. Marco called out, Eddie. Eddie then fully turned around. He was standing directly under a street light, and apparently his eyes were bulging and he was laughing. Marco said that he had never seen such an expression on Eddie's face before then. 
Marco called out to Eddie to come back, but Eddie never responded. And he just continued to walk. Just before 10 p.m., Ryan arrived home. As he entered the front door, he noticed the water running in the bathroom at the end of the hall. He then looked into the dining room and saw his mother lying on the floor. He rushed to her side, knelt down, and touched her shoulder. She did not respond. He immediately ran across the street to the Ryan's home and asked for help. Eddie's father called 911, and Somerville police officer Joseph Blair arrived within one minute. As he entered the house, he saw blood on the wall, on the stairs leading to the second floor, and blood streaks on the frame of the doorway leading to the dining room. He looked into the dining room and saw Janet Downing lying face up on the floor. Her golden retriever was lying next to her. The dog got, the dog got up, grabbed Officer Blair's hand in his mouth, led him over to Janet, and sat down next to her again. Officer Blair tried to check for a pulse on the right side of Janet's neck. As he did so, a gaping wound opened in her neck. At that point, he called for help. Paramedics arrived and attempted to resuscitate Janet. After 15 minutes of emergency treatment, the, par the paramedics rushed her to the hospital where she was pregnant. When detectives arrived, they started looking closely at the home. They noticed that there was some furniture overturned and blood stains on the carpets, the staircase, and the stucco wall. On the third step, they found a small piece of metal similar to the hilt of a knife. There were drops of blood near the bathroom where the water was overflowing in the sink and blood stains and what appeared to be a bloody fingerprint on the front door near the doorknob. In the dining room, there was a large blood stain on the floor where Janet's body was found. There were blood spatters on the wall and blood streams on the door casings and near the light switch. In the kitchen, there were drops of blood on the floor, on the fridge, and on the doorknob leading to the basement. As the detectives were following the blood trail, they saw blood stains on both walls along the narrow basement staircase. There appeared to be a fingerprint in blood on a wooden post at the bottom of the staircase. There were some blood stains on clothing hanging on a clothesline, and behind the clothesline was the door leading to the backyard. The door was partially open. Now, while all of this was going on, Eddie appeared at the midnight convenience store. He seemed distraught and was bleeding from cuts to his index finger, pinky, and thumb. Store clerk Frank Golden asked him what happened. Eddie said that he was stabbed when a black man and a Hispanic man robbed him. Mr. Golden asked him if he wanted to call the police. At first, Eddie said no, but then agreed after Mr. Golden asked a, sec a second time. Mr. Golden heard Eddie calmly explain to the police that he was at the midnight convenience store and that he had just been jumped. While Eddie waited at the convenience store, Garvey, Seth, Marco, and Marco's father arrived at the store. They had already been to Boston Street and heard about Janet. Marco twice asked Eddie, if he had heard about Janet, but Eddie did not respond. After a third time, Eddie responded, Yeah, I heard. 
The two boys asked Eddie about his injuries, and he explained that he had been attacked by two knife-wielding men and that he had cut his legs when he fell to the pavement. Now remember, this kid was over six feet tall and close to 300 pounds. He's the last person anyone would want anyone would want to target for a robbery. But back at the Downing home, investigators heard that Eddie had been robbed and stabbed in Union Square because the police now had two violent crimes in the same area at the same time. Sergeant James Stanford and State Police Trooper Joseph Duggan went to the Somerville Hospital to interview Eddie. Eddie told the officers that he left his house between 7.30 and 8.30 to go to Burger King. He stated that the place was crowded, so he continued on to Union Square. He then repeated the story about the black man and Hispanic man robbing him, but added that the Hispanic man said, You saw our faces. Now I have to stab you. The man swung at Eddie with a knife, catching Eddie's hand. Eddie said that he fell backward onto the sidewalk and the men ran off. He was calm as he recounted the story and showed no emotion. After leaving the hospital, Eddie and his father were alone in their car as they drove to the spot in Union Square, where Eddie claimed to have been attacked. It was a well-lit area. Car and foot traffic was heavy. Trooper Duggan and Sergeant Stanford canvassed the area thoroughly with Eddie and found no blood and no... Monday, July 24th. 1995. Paul Downing called Jeannie O'Brien, his friend and Eddie's sister, the morning after Janet's murder. Eddie answered the phone and expressed his sympathies. He told Paul that he had been jumped and stabbed in Union Square on that same night. Ryan later called Eddie out of concern Eddie repeated the story of the attack and added that he got scrat his legs got scratched when he fell to his knees and that the only witnesses were quote a couple drunks across the road. Ryan asked Eddie if he had seen anything suspicious in the neighborhood when he had left to go to Burger King and Eddie replied no. Also that morning Garvey, John, Seth, Joey, and Marco came to Eddie's house. Eddie's father told Garvey that Eddie wanted to speak with him privately in the backyard. There, Garvey told Eddie that Marco, Seth, and John had seen him the previous night jumping onto Hamlet Street from the bushes behind the Downing House. Eddie denied it. What Eddie didn't know, however, was that Marco had already told the police what he had seen. He asked Eddie how he got the scratches on his legs, and Eddie said he didn't know. Later, Marco asked him why he was in the bushes at the Downing's house that night, and Eddie did not. Tuesday, July 25th, 1995, a search warrant is executed at Eddie's house. When the state police conducted a search of the O'Brien home, they found a red-handled knife wrapped in a paper towel and the trash barrel behind the house. Also on this day, Ryan called Eddie and asked if he could be an altar server at his mother's funeral mass. Eddie declined, 
saying he forgot how to serve at Mass. Ryan persisted, and Eddie finally said that he just couldn't do it. Janet Downing's autopsy was performed on July 24th, 1995. At this point, I would like to repeat my warning in the beginning of the video. If you have any sensitivity to listening to this kind of material, please click away now. The coroner identified a total of 66 stab wounds and 32 slash wounds on Janet Downing's body. This included five stab and slash wounds to the back of her head, 22 slash wounds across her neck, along with some stab wounds. And the chest area was 38 stab wounds, many of which were deep. Two of the knife thrusts went up into her neck. Five stab wounds and an abrasion was found on her back. One stab wound was delivered with such force that it cut one of her ribs in half. One stab wound punctured her lower left lung and two stab wounds punctured her liver. Seven stabs penetrated her upper right lung and these seven wounds corresponded to only two exterior wounds, meaning that Eddie thrust the knife into two of the exterior wounds more than once. Two stab wounds and a slash wound were found on her thigh, three slash wounds on her arm, and two slash wounds to her left hand and fingers. Abrasions and contusions were found on her head, lower lip, chin, her left arm, her ear, the bridge of her nose, and the left side of her chin. The coroner also found small wounds on her chin consistent with being made by the tip of a knife. Hemorrhaging was present in all these wounds indicating that Janet Downing was alive when the wounds were inflicted. Detectives compared the knife hilt found on the third step to the hilt of the red knife in Eddie's trash and got a perfect match. The coroner also concluded that the knife found in Eddie's trash was capable of inflicting the wounds that killed Janet Downing. Eddie's fingerprints were found in Janet's blood on the inside of the front door, on the wooden post in the basement, and Eddie's blood was found in the front hallway, the dining room door jam on the second step, on the back of one of the pictures that had fallen to the floor, and on clothes hanging on the basement clothesline. At trial, a psychologist noted that Eddie suffered from treatable psychological problems, including a possible emotional disturbance, a thought disorder, emotional immaturity, impaired thinking, and over-reliance on fantasy. He noted that Eddie's unruffled temperament suggested that he may have the emotional characteristics of a psychopath. While Eddie initially claimed that he had not been in the Downing home on the night of the murder, when presented with the evidence that placed him at the scene, he changed his story. He claimed that when he went to the Downing home and saw Janet lying on the floor, he went over to help, but at that point, 
he had encountered a masked man over the body of Janet. And the man and the man threatened to kill him if he told anybody about what he had seen. Edward O'Brien Jr. was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. In October of 1997, Middlesex County District Attorney Tom Riley recalled that when Eddie was arrested and charged with Janet's murder, he was unnaturally cool. He said there was nothing uh, coming out of him, nothing, no fear, no screaming, nothing in any way that resembled what you might expect out of a 15-year-old kid who was charged with cutting up his best friend's mother. His eyes were black. There was nothing in there. It made my blood run cold. This is the current picture of Eddie right where he belongs in prison. In memory of 